The Tom Woods Show, episode 1785. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, when you criticize the Federal Reserve, you get all these lackey-style responses. Why the Fed has made the economy more stable. You don't want to go back to the 19th century, do you? All kinds of arguments like that. Well, you can blow those and others out of the water with my free ebook, Our Enemy, the Fed. Grab it at OurEnemyTheFed.com. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Tom Woods here. Debate episode for you two days in a row. This time it's David Stockman, former director of the Office of Management and Budget. That was under Ronald Reagan. Also U.S. congressman, author, investment banker. And Walter Block, who is a professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans. He's the author of the well-known book, Defending the Undefendable, but many other books and hundreds and hundreds of peer-reviewed articles are out there. You can check out at walterblock.com. And this is not going to be a formal debate, really, but we just want to discuss something that David wrote. Maybe some of you saw this article. It has a rather provocative title. And uh, David approached me and said, what if we did a debate on the show? And the debate really boils down to what libertarian voting strategy ought to be. Should we vote for the lesser of two evils kind of thing? Now, that's not, it's not purely that. It's specifically more the question of should libertarians have held their noses and voted for Trump because he might have been better on X, Y, or Z? Uh, That was the opinion, uh, more or less the opinion of Walter Block in certain swing states, at least. And David's view, rather, is that Trump absolutely deserved to lose. So we're going to have them hash this out. All right, so since we don't have a formal resolution we're debating, the way I think I'm going to do it is just have each of you talk for a few minutes. And I'm, I'm actually going to have David talk first, even though that really is unfair and makes no sense because David is actually criticizing Walter. You'd think I'd let Walter spell out his position first, but I'm going to let David start because he actually had the stones to write an article called Walter Block's Damn Nonsense. And I just feel like, the sheer <laughs> gall of that deserves something. So, so, and I think is I know you guys have areas of agreement, but let's start off focusing on the areas of disagreement. So, David Walter is is an elder statesman of the libertarian movement. What in heaven's name could he have done to justify an article like that? Well, by now it's pretty academic, uh, you know. But that's half point- of what we talk about on the Tom Wood <laughs> Show. <laughs> yeah. academic stuff. Yeah, but my my point was, and that was before the election that the 2020 presidential election is not the last rodeo. We have a decade of crucial elections in front of us, whether where um, the future of liberty, uh, constitutional government, capitalist prosperity will be won or lost. And that will depend on the recreation and resurrection of a honest conservative opposition party that we don't have today, and that Donald Trump is basically um, eliminated by what I call Trumpifying the Republican Party. We have two government parties today, a right-wing government party that uh, Trump essentially uh, created out of what was a failing Republican Party anyway, and of course, uh, the uh, longstanding incumbent uh, government party of the Democrats, the interventionists, the liberals, uh, the progressives, and all the rest. So my feeling was it really didn't matter in the short run how the 2020 election came out because uh, a Biden-Kamala Harris regency, if it comes to that, uh, will, would not be significantly worse on the crucial matters of central bank policy and fiscal policy than uh, would a Trump administration. And my point is that that's the heart of the matter. Uh, uh, The danger to everything we believe in, (laughs) uh, personal liberty, uh, capitalist prosperity, limited constitutional government, uh, the heart of the statism that threatens that is a central bank that just keeps printing money 
that allows the politicians to keep spending and borrowing because that's where the state expands. And we're seeing that now in dramatic form in the case of uh, this whole you know, fight against the COVID so-called, the lockdown nation, uh, uh, you know, intervention in the economy. None of that would have happened. We can say it's a terrible thing. Uh, you know, uh, individual rights are being cast aside. Uh, property rights of small businesses are being destroyed. But none of that, in my view, would have happened even under a Trump administration had it not been so easy for the government to you know, pump $3 trillion worth of bailouts and uh, compensation for lost jobs and incomes and cash flow to businesses because uh, the Fed was standing ready, able, and eager to print uh, the money uh, to monetize all the debt. So if you look at what Trump stands for, what he's done over the last four years, it was easier and easier and easier money. He out-democrated, uh, you know, any Democrat, uh, including Obama. Uh, when it comes to uh, the fiscal accounts, uh, the spending record of Trump is the worst of any president by far in the last 50 or 60 years. He took the public debt from 19 to 27 trillion. That gain basically was the same as all the money borrowed by the first 43 presidents. So uh, the point is uh, that um, those policies uh, are the heart of the danger that we face. And until the Republican Party is purged of the idea that deficits don't matter and that the central bank can monetize unlimited amounts uh, of public debt, until it's purged of that idea, I see no hope either way. It's just a matter of you know, how fast you get uh, to some kind of real catastrophe and um, fiscal and uh, debt disaster in this country. So uh, to summarize, my theme was, this is not the last rodeo. What was at issue here was not the minor difference between uh, Trump uh, and Biden, which has now been resolved in favor of Biden, but the question of whether the Republican Party could be rescued from Trumpism and from uh, what I call right-wing statism and re be reconstituted uh, along what I call the Taftian principles of sound money, fiscal rectitude, free markets, limited government, real federalism, and non-intervention abroad. I think the chances of that happening are quite small. <laughs> it's pretty far gone. The Republican Party is dominated you know, by the neocons who are, you know, global status and by all kinds of uh, interest groups that really don't care about the core issues of sound money and fiscal rectitude. All right, well, but let me but jump in and ask, if, what specifically is it about Walter that you're unhappy with? I, I, the only thing I was unhappy with is that he said, you know, that the libertarians who voted uh, uh, didn't vote for Trump in the four states, uh, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and uh, Pennsylvania, that looked like would have made the difference uh, at the time. Um, put Biden in office, and my, you know, my answer, my uh, response was, "So what? That wasn't the most important thing, or even uh, close to the important thing on the ballot in uh, 2020. The important thing was getting rid of Trump, purging Trumpism from the Republican Party on the small chance that maybe someone like Rand Paul and a few uh, of his hearty band in, yet in the Republican Party." Uh, could uh, bring us back uh, to uh, the Taftian path. Uh, I don't think it's very likely that it'll happen, but if it doesn't, <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're you know we're at the end of the road. So at least uh, that's a small opportunity that we still have. All right, Walter, uh, defend your honor, and then I <laughs> want to interject uh, myself. David is a rotten kid. He <laughs> dared to criticize me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding about that. Uh, you know, usually when I get into the debate with somebody, it's usually a commie or a socialist or a neocon. But, you know, I'm a big fan of David's. And I was a little shocked that he was so harsh uh, with me. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that we agree on 99.3% of everything in political economy. And I'm not sure about the other uh, point, uh, 0.7. 
Um, but I'm a big fan of his, and it's an honor to be in this uh, conversation. I'm glad you started off by saying it's not really a debate, more of a conversation, because we agree on, on so much. But there are minor difficulties. Uh, let me just mention a few. Um, first of all, I disagree with David when he said Biden has won. He hasn't won as of today. Uh, Donald has not uh, exercised all of his um, possible uh, responses. And uh, my, uh, I had several bets with several people that Donald is going to be the next president. Yeah. Because, um, you know, it's not over until the fat lady sings. It's not over until all the courts uh, decide. And the Supreme Court, I, I don't think the Supreme Court is going to say, well, Donald wins, uh, Biden loses. But I mean, they might say, look, this... Uh, this uh, election was so screwed up and there was so much uh, chicanery and, and um, uh, what do you call it, uh, cemetery voting yeah. that uh, we're going to have the, uh, uh, the House of Representatives vote and each state will get one vote and there are more Republican states than Democrats. So uh, I think it's entirely possible that uh, Donald will win. Secondly, um, uh, here I agree, certainly Rand Paul would be, uh, well, Ron Paul would be great, but Ron Paul isn't going to make it in 24. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rand Paul is uh, pretty good. Uh, no, uh, excellent, excellent, exquisite, wonderful. But here again, I, I depart from David because uh, David is saying that he doesn't want Trump to win. Um, if Trump doesn't win, he can run in 24 and maybe beat um, uh, Rand Paul again as he beat him uh, in uh, 2016. So I think um, David uh, should uh, favor um, uh, uh, Trump winning and, and not uh, excoriate me for uh, supporting Trump. Then we have the problem of the, uh, what do they call it, the, um, the diamonds water paradox. Uh, you know, which is more important, diamonds or water? And, and what we know from economics is uh, you really can't um, say. It's a, it's a marginal, not a total thing. You know, on the one hand, uh, if, if all the diamonds disappear in the world, uh, it won't be so bad. You know, diamonds are a girl's best friend, but she'll have rubies and em emeralds. On the other hand, if all water disappears, you know, <laughs> we've had it. Uh, no more life. But this little cup of diamonds versus this little cup of water, obviously, the marginal diamond is worth more. So when David says um, central banking and fiscal policy is it, is the key, uh, it, it sort of uh, veers in, in the direction of diamonds, water um, problems. You know, I sometimes uh, think of myself as the um, uh, advisor to Ron Paul. And if Ron Paul were president, I uh, not only advisor, but predictor, what would he do? I think the first thing he would do is not get rid of the Fed and, and address fiscal policy and uh, central banking. Uh, he would uh, pull all the troops home. Second thing I think he would do is give a pardon to every uh, prisoner in jail for a, a non-violent uh, crime or a victimless crime. And the third thing I think he would do is what David is saying is, um, uh, you know, uh, address fiscal monetary policy and the Fed, etc. Uh, but here again, I'm um, uh, engaging in the same problem of the diamonds water fallacy. You know, uh, you can't say what's the most important thing. Maybe education is the most important thing because if people weren't so miseducated, we wouldn't be so screwed up in the first place and Ron Paul would have been president. Uh, so you really can't say, well, you know, this is, this is the key and everything else sort of uh, goes by the wayside. Um, and, and I think that, you know, Donald is way better than, than Biden uh, or any neocon uh, is on foreign policy. And foreign policy is pretty important. Uh, it's true he hired a whole bunch of advisors that were neocons, which was a big mistake on his part, slight mistake or a gigantic mistake. But he has tendencies in that direction. Look, he's, he's the only one that said, look, we've been in Afghanistan 17 years. You know, uh, what's with that? Nobody's, uh, nobody's ever said that uh, as far as I'm concerned on the Democrat. Uh, well, no, no, Bernie Sanders is pretty good on foreign policy. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, there are, if I had, you know, if I had a libertarian leader and I had to rate people on, on libertarianism, I would rate uh, David and, and Ron Paul and, and Rand Paul and uh, Murray Rothbard and you, Tom, uh, you know, 99 plus. How would I rate Donald and um, Biden? Well, I'd rate Donald as a 10 and, and uh, Biden as a 1. Uh, namely, I think that uh, Donald is better. Uh, Donald is better on the libertarian meter on foreign policy. Uh, he's better on uh, regulation. He's better on taxes. He's better on education. He's better on um, masks and lockdowns and, and um, 
you know, inclusiveness and affirmative action, um, uh, uh, labor unions. Uh, I mean, Bernie Sanders might be the, um, uh, the labor secretary, and we're not going to have a $15 an hour minimum wage. We're going to have a I don't know, a million dollar an hour minimum wage if, if they had their druthers, but they'll settle for 25 or 50. And then what's going to happen to the unemployment rate of um, unskilled black workers? And they wants to pack the court and wants to make um, Washington, D.C. and um, Puerto Rico states and uh, get rid of the filibuster uh, on abortion. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're crazy, uh, the, the Democrats. So uh, it, it's a whole panoply of things. And I think it's very clear that Donald is better on, uh, from a libertarian point of view than, um, uh, uh, than Biden. And what I did uh, along with Ralph Rako and um, uh, Dr. I, I forget his name, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. We started this thing called Libertarians for Trump. And our idea was if you're in a red state or in a blue state, either Donald um, doesn't need your vote or he's gonna win anyway. So vote for uh, Gary Johnson, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the libertarian. On the other hand, if you're in a purple state, like um, uh, as David mentioned, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Nevada, uh, Arizona, maybe Michigan, Georgia, whatever, well, then Donald needs your vote, so vote for him. And that's what I put in the Wall Street Journal. And then Donald, uh, you know, Donald lost it with me and said, no, 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 you're, you're, you're crazy, or, you know, you're, you're an imbecile. I forget the word <laughs> was, but it was, it was, he was a nasty fellow. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, I don't see what I did so wrong. It, it seems to me that we want liberty. Uh, uh, we, we have children. We have grandchildren. We, we want a better life for them. And uh, a better life, I think, is Donald versus um, um, uh, Joe, sleepy Joe Biden. Okay, uh, David, you take a couple minutes to reply to that. Then I'll give Walter a chance. And then uh, Old Woods here has a word to say. Okay. Well, there's a lot there to reply to. But let me start by saying... I had no intention of criticizing uh, Walter Block, okay? That wasn't my purpose. My purpose was defending the libertarian voters in those four purple states who viewed the world the same way I did, which was it's better at this juncture to stand for principle and hope the Republican Party can be reconstituted and you know, reoriented in the decade ahead and in the elections ahead because Trump, at the end of the day, is not going to get us anywhere. Now, I would uh, mention that when it comes to foreign policy, the empire, as I call it, uh, I'm totally on the same wavelength, Walter, that you're on, and I've done plenty of preaching and writing and so forth about that. My disappointment with Trump is that uh, basically he's all hat, no cattle, as they say in Texas. In other words, he mouths the right words when it comes to ending the forever wars. Um, he has said the right things about what the hell are we doing in Syria or why are we still in Afghanistan 19 years later. But he has been the commander in chief. He has been the president of the United States uh, for damn near four years. And he hired every one of the enemies who put us in all those positions in the first place. John Bolton is beyond the pale. He's a madman, he's a war criminal. Uh, he's a, the neocon godfather, if you wanna use that word. And Trump didn't even have enough sense not to bring him right into the inner sanction of the Oval Office and listen to him. Uh, he brought in Mattis. Today, Mattis is dumping on him and get you saying, oh, thank, thank heavens for Biden, get rid of uh, America first. Well, you know, these are the kind of people he brought in. Pompeo is a screaming disaster. The man is, you know, an embarrassment. He ought to go back to his wheat farm in Kansas or wherever he came from. But, I mean, he's the worst secretary of state we've ever had from the point of view of warmongering, even going back to Woodrow Wilson, secretary of state, who was, uh, you know, in 1917, who was a uh, shill for the uh, Morgan interests and got us into World War One. That's how bad it is. Now, but beyond that, so talking one thing and doing the opposite, he basically stymied himself. He wanted to get us out of, he couldn't even get 900 troops out of Syria because after he said, we want to get out and tweeted, we want to get out, they basically just ignored it. And now you have the special uh, envoy for uh, the Middle East or for Syria actually saying we sabotaged him all the way through, and he was Trump's pick. Now, there's a bigger point on this, though, and that is 
the military industrial complex is so massive that I like to think of it as a self-licking ice cream cone. The more money you give them, the more uh, money spills into the think tanks and to the NGOs and to all the firms uh, positioned along the Beltway who come up with reasons and missions and justifications and rationalizations for stupid, idiotic things like we're still in Germany, you know, uh, a half a century after World War II ended and so forth. And Trump's uh, contribution on that score is terrible because without any real uh, analysis, without any real understanding of what he was doing, he just gave the Pentagon a blank check. We're now at $750 billion of spending, up $150 billion from what he inherited, and we've got uh, another $100 billion in foreign aid, national security, uh, uh, foreign operations, and all the rest of it. So there's an $850 billion machine finding all kinds of reasons to keep us in, uh, you know, enmeshed in empire around the world. And you get a president like Trump who tweets every now and then that it's not a good idea, and they simply laugh and walk away. So he accomplished nothing. And that's the same thing I would say uh, basically about the biggest single threat to liberty in our time. And I'm going all the way back to the 1960s when I was protesting the Vietnam War, and that is lockdown nation. Uh, that is what I call the virus patrol that has unleashed all these governors and mayors to basically regulate uh, you know, our very uh, daily uh, activity. Um, and all of that I blame on Trump. Yes, in the last few weeks or months, he said, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's not going to lock down the country again and so forth. But here's the point. It was his task force, the White House Coronavirus Task Force, headed by this idiot Fauci, Dr. Fauci, and the scarf lady, Dr. Burks, and Redman at the CDC, who created the whole rationale for this, uh, you know, COVID hysteria that has gripped the country. They created the cover story with all of their recommendations and their rhetoric and their um, you know, fear mongering that unleash the governors and mayors, including a lot of Republican governors. I mean, if you look at Maryland today, uh, the Hogan there is as bad as uh, the, the governor of New York and so on. All of this was unleashed by a operation that had Trump's sanction imprimatur and support. And even maybe when it became obvious to him that, you know, we were going off the deep end. He didn't have enough common sense and cojones, if I may say so, to fire Fauci and fire Burks and fire Redmond uh, or Redford, whatever his name is, and the whole rest of the virus patrol, and thereby begin to take control of this in terms of the narrative and, um, you know, allowing uh, the people of this country to have some basis to stand up against their out of control governors and mayors. So, again, all hat and no cattle. And so on the good things that he might have tweeted, uh, you know, he basically undermined them by massive increases in defense spending and support of the, um, you know, war on the uh, virus. And of course, what he hasn't done on fiscal and monetary and his attacks on the Fed for being too, uh, high, you know, being too tight when it was struggling to make small steps towards normalization. I think if you put all that together, there's nothing to be said that's a virtue. And uh, he has just misled the whole Republican Party. For crying out loud, we just finished a year where we borrowed 50 cents on the dollar of what we spent. <laughs> uh, you know, it is out of control fiscally, and you have a Republican Party that's basically been euthanized uh, by this very bad uh, leadership from the Oval Office. So I say good riddance. Uh, he wasn't doing enough good to uh, uh, compensate for the massive damage uh, that uh, his tenure uh, brought about. And by getting rid of him, at least maybe there's a small opening 
uh, to try to get the Republican Party back to these Taftian principles, which are the only way that uh, what we believe in is going to survive in the decades ahead. All right, a few minutes, Walter, and then I'm dying to say something, so <laughs> I have to do that. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention that the third person in, in Libertarians for Trump was Dr. Donald Miller. I forgot his uh, name, and I apologize for that. Uh, he was very instrumental in, in doing this with me and Ralph. Um, when my kids were small, uh, they would argue with each other, and they'd say, anything you say, I can do better. <laughs> well, I say to David, anything you say about Trump, I can do better <laughs> with, with Biden. And, and, um, and you're condemned out of your own mouth, uh, David. I'm now reading uh, uh, from your piece, uh, Shut Up, Man, which was your analysis uh, on Lou Rockwell uh, about the, right after the first debate. And you say, um, Biden's calamitous embrace of the Green New Deal, the myth of systematic racism and white supremacy, the fallout of more uh, COVID lockdowns based on purported science, the final wreckage of the badly listing U.S. healthcare system via nationalization, otherwise known as medical care for all. Um, and then you go on about um, uh, 47 months Donald has been in office and he's done less harm than Joe Biden in the past 47 years. Of course, you know, president is more important than senator or vice president. So you're condemned out of your own mouth. Now, look, I'm a big fan of that book of yours where you excoriate Donald Trump and you do a magnificent job and I love it. <laughs> but anything you say about Donald, I can say worse about um, uh, Biden. Let me tell you about a joke. I'm sure you've heard it. You're an economist. Um, Tom, you're, you're a historian. You might not have heard of this joke and maybe the audience didn't. The economist was asked, how is your wife? And the answer was, compared to what? <laughs> yeah. Compared to what? Yes, yes, Donald is... is is very bad. Uh, I'm reading from a New York Times um, uh, uh, column here by uh, Gerard Baker. Trump is terribly flawed, but the alternative is simply terrible. Yes, tr Trump is terribly flawed. He's only 10 out of 100 on, on the libertarian meter. And I'm giving Biden a one. I should give him a negative number, but I'm, I'm only in positive numbers. Look, uh, you say that uh, uh, Trump is all hat and no cattle. You're absolutely right. But Biden doesn't even have a hat. <laughs> at, 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 least, yeah. at, at, least, at least Trump has got a hat. Mm -hmm. Biden doesn't have a hat. Uh, he, he did say that, you know, we've been in there, uh, Afghanistan for 17 or 19 years. What's that? Biden would never say anything like that. Um, he's done, you know, he pulled troops out of here and he put them in Germany or something. Okay, look, I agree with you. Uh, Trump is no, <laughs> no bargain. He's not very good. Although, you know, uh, everyone says that he's an, you say he's an obnoxious braggart and blowhard. And I agree. But, how, you know, it, it just so happens that I'm from Brooklyn and he's from Queens. And, and uh, the, the two boroughs are next door to each other. And, and we sort of have the same uh, belt on Sean. Yeah. Uh, and everyone in Brooklyn and Queens is, is an obnoxious braggart and, and blowhard. You know, so I sort of, uh, uh, I don't have a Trump derangement syndrome over that. And then you say, you know, we, we got to uh, make uh, improvements in the Republican Party. Well, as I said before in, in my opening statement, if you're really serious about that, you should have favored Donald to win. And he still might. That's a, an, another issue. Because if he doesn't win now, he can run in 24 and he could beat, um, he could beat uh, Rand Paul again in 24 like he beat him in 16. So even from your own premises, from which I agree, not only agree, but enthusiastically support everything you say about Donald is, is correct. He's horrible. It's just the other guy is worse. And if you really want to cleanse the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a risk. He could come back in 24 and he could uh, stay around as the, the ostensible leader. Whereas if he won this time, we'd get rid of him mm. uh, after four years because he's not going for a third term. So, um, I um, uh, I can't I, I agree with your premises, but your conclusions I find very problematic. Uh, and I think that you say, well, you were critical of my Wall Street Journal article because I excoriated the libertarians who uh, voted for um, uh, Joe Jorgensen, who got um, uh, more than one percent. And and look, look at what's happening in Georgia now with the two elections. Purdue would have won. And the Republicans would have had 51 uh, senators. Right now, they got 50. And if and if the Republicans lose both seats in uh, Georgia, guess who is going to be the deciding vote? Your buddy and my buddy, Kamala, who is even worse than Joe, probably because she's a you know 
trajectories really, uh, really bad. And, you know, uh, Biden uh, might not last out four years of the presidency. And, and if not, then we got Kamala and Kamala is horrible. So I, I can't see how, how you can um, how, how you can excoriate me for excoriating the libertarians who uh, uh, didn't uh, follow the advice of libertarians for Trump, namely in a purple state like Georgia or Pennsylvania. Uh, give Donald a break because he's much better, much, much better than Biden. And and you're saying, no, no, they were right. They're, they're principled, yak, yak, yak about principles and all that. No, look, I agree with you on the principles, obviously. But, you know, uh, th- these people um, had no had no sense. They spoiled the election, as, as the Wall Street Journal article said. They spoiled it for Donald Trump because it's possible. Look, it, it, he might have lost anyway because of the ballot stuffing and the cemetery vote. But forgetting about that for a second, the Libertarians got 1.2% of the vote. That might have pushed Donald over, over the hump. And, and now uh, we would have President-elect Donald instead of possibly President-elect uh, Joe, although you know the major media is all, all saying that. So to summarize my point, I agree with your premises. You do a magnificent word, uh, work in, um, uh, in making the case against Donald. But, you know, anything you say about Donald, I can say about um, I can say about um, uh, Biden and, and, you know, the health care business and regulations and taxes. And, and there's so many areas where he's worse. There are some areas where um, on trade, maybe uh, Donald is really bad on trade. I'll admit that he's a protectionist. Biden might not be as much a protectionist. But if you look at all all the um, dimensions of what a president does, uh, you got to give the nod to Donald. You know, normally when I've done these kind of debate episodes, I will interject with a question for each of the debaters. But I have a question really only for Dave at this time, and it basically runs like this. I get that for you and your writing and your concerns and your interests, the Fed and fiscal policy are just front and center. And I couldn't be more sympathetic. I'm very – I think those things are extremely important. I've written a lot about them myself. I've come to the conclusion that there is just zero constituency for this. Just nobody cares. I mean, obviously the left doesn't care. There's nobody on the left who also favors fiscal rectitude. A very, very few. And even the right wing, you can barely get them even to pay attention to you. And the Fed, forget about it. I mean, we've had the Fed for over 100 years. Yeah, we have some critics of it, but most people don't understand how it works. There's no way we could convince them to get rid of it. I mean, I'm not saying we don't try. I'm just saying it's highly, highly unlikely that any and that's going to happen. But what is possible, the sorts of things that are within the realm of possibility to change, are the sorts of things where Trump sometimes was okay. Like, for example, there wasn't going to be a climate czar under Trump. Uh, there wasn't going to be critical, or at least, you know, Trump found out about critical race theory and moved against it. All the sorts of, try to think of one loathsome group who wasn't opposed to Trump. It's very hard. It's very, every single group working to undermine every decent thing was against him. Now, I, I have all the same problems with him that you guys have, but facts are facts. And yes, he mishandled the pandemic. That's true because he trusted in the guy who every president has trusted in, Fauci. But if there'd been a Mitt Romney even though Scott Atlas worked for Mitt Romney, there's no way Mitt Romney would have turned to Scott Atlas. He would have turned to Fauci. And there's no way Scott Atlas is going to have a microphone under a Joe Biden. Joe Biden means the return of the the left-wing public health establishment. It means Fauci 24 hours a day. It means climate nonsense. It means, I mean, every conceivable loathsome thing. And Trump, there has to be a reason that every loathsome group in the, in the country was working overtime to exaggerate, make up stuff about Trump and smear him to destroy him. There has to be, and he, I think, in some ways represented, yeah, we're not gonna get reform of the Fed, we're not gonna get abolition of the Fed, we're gonna have terrible fiscal policy, but I happen to think those things are just baked into the cake. But what we did get was at least a guy who doesn't loathe the very sight of us and who was standing up to an absolute avalanche of evil. And I think surely he deserves some credit for that. Well, I, you know, I think there are two uh, issues here. One is I, I realize there's zero constituency for sound money and fiscal rectitude, but I also think it's the heart of all the other evils you mentioned, and I'll go through that in a second. Secondly, when it comes to the uh, difference, you know, I don't think there's any point in debating the merit uh, between uh, Trump, where there are not many, and uh, Biden, where there are none at all, because 
you know, that's that's kind of abstract. That's that's sort of a checklist of issue positions. I was looking at this more dynamically from a political point of view. And my view is that notwithstanding the tough races that are happening in Georgia, the Republicans are still going to end up with controlling the Senate 52 to 48 or 51 to 49. Either way, they can't bust the filibuster. And if they don't bust the filibuster, you need 60 votes to get anything done of substance. And that's never going to happen. You're not going to get mansion on all these kinds of crazy things, uh, you know, Medicare for all or the Green New Deal or, uh, you know, adding uh, D.C. and Puerto Rico uh, uh, to the electoral, to the Senate, uh, to the Congress and so forth. So uh, all of the bad stuff that Biden stands for and uh, his progressive uh, left allies uh, believe in even more uh, dangerously, I think isn't going to pass through the 60% filibuster hurdle in the next four years. So therefore, the bad stuff, in my view, has a very low, low um, odds of happening. But unless we can get the Republican Party back on its feet and back on its principle, uh, you know, we're not going to be any better off in 24, 28 or, you know, uh, 2032, if anybody can see ahead that far. Secondly, I would say to Walter about uh, the second uh, Trump term. Uh, I know uh, I didn't know Grover Cleveland. But I know that Donald Trump is no Grover Cleveland, okay? Grover Cleveland stood for a lot of good things, like the gold standard and free trade and small government and balanced budgets. Uh, the, the real point, though, is that Trump is going to spend the next four years being chased from one end of the earth to the, uh, the other by litigation from, uh, you know, the state, uh, the states, uh, the, uh, the attorney in the, uh, New York, uh, uh, private uh, litigants, his empire is going to unwind. Uh, they're, you know, they've got uh, hundreds of billions of debt coming due. I mean, this whole thing that Trump was some brilliant businessman never stood up. He was just uh, a lucky guy who uh, rode the bubble that the Fed created in real estate from the mid uh, 80s uh, to the time that uh, he, he got into the political business. So my point is, I'm not going to worry about the odds of Trump resurrecting in 19, uh, 2024. It's not going to happen. So with the Biden progressive left uh, Kamala Harris uh, uh, stopped by the filibuster and Trump uh, out of business for the rest of his life, the issue is, how can we get from here to there over the coming decades? And the answer is the bad stuff, Tom, that you uh, laid out. All of it, I think, stems from bad money and, uh, you know, fiscal incontinence, uh, uh, libertine, fiscal libertinism, if you want to use that term, because it all takes money. We still have an empire. We're, we still have, you know, forces in all these countries. We still have all these wars that we can't seem to end because it's so damn easy to finance $850 billion dollars worth of national security spending are really a trillion when you take the cost of veterans who are just deferred costs of all these wars that we didn't need, when it's so easy to finance that because if push comes to sho a shove on the margin, you borrow it and the Fed monetizes it and nobody objects in the short run, although in the long run you're paving the way uh, to perdition, okay? The same is true with the lockdown. We, we all agree, probably the worst thing that's happened in terms of libertarian principles in the last decades that I can remember are these lockdowns and the closure without any due process, without any standards, without any appeal of, you know, millions of businesses. Um, the, the orders uh, to citizens to basically... Uh, obey, as uh, Dr. Fauci said the other day. This is really terrible, but I'll tell you, and I've made this argument, and I'll keep writing about it in my daily uh, posts if I have to, that wouldn't have happened if there wasn't back-to-back -back with uh, that uh, so-called 14-day uh, temporary lockdown, 3.3 .3 trillion worth of 
massive bailouts and walking around money and helicopter checks to, you know, 160 million people and uh, unemployment benefits, state and federal combined that average 57,000 per year on an annual basis. Without all of that money, people would have been up in arms. They would have been hungry. They would have been angry. They would have been, uh, you know, uh, 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 filing into uh, Washington and into the state capitals and city halls uh, in massive numbers. But it didn't happen because they were all bought off uh, with this uh, extreme fiscal largesse, which in turn went through the Senate, uh, uh, Republican Senate, like green grass through a goose. Uh, because uh, they all knew the Fed was going to print it. The Fed was saying uh, when they passed it in late March that we're going to print the whole thing. So you could you could say that socialized medicine. We have socialized medicine today. It's just a matter of degree whether it's Obamacare heavy, which they talk about, Obamacare light, which the Republicans wanted, or Obamacare, which we have. The whole thing is one big bloody socialist mess enormously expensive, and it's all on the margin made uh, possible by um, the the easy uh, borrowing and fiscal, uh, you know, uh, uh, largesse uh, of the federal government. So at the end of the day, I think uh, the the bad money and the fiscal uh, excess are not simply uh, uh, very important issues in themselves. I think they're the key to everything else. And I don't think liberty has a chance of surviving. I don't think we're going to, uh, in the end, stop uh, the progressive woke left from doing all the damage that it wants to do as long as there is an open checkbook uh, for uh, the federal government uh, to sort of hand out money and buy off uh, the opposition that results. In other words, we've created a new entitlement. This is really bad, really dangerous, and it's, enti- and it's an entitlement to recompense, an entitlement for indemnification every time the government does something stupid and you lose your job or you lose your income or you're a business and you lose your cash flow. I mean, we, we put out $525 billion in a couple of weeks to 5 million businesses because they said, I'm hurt. Well, you know, can you imagine that? Just all you do is raise your arm and say you're you're hurting because something stupid the government did. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you get a a big check. Well, what if they outlaw fossil fuel? Uh, You know, you get a check because you lost your job. What if they outlaw gas combustion engines? You get a check because your car is illegal to put on the street. We're in really a bad way. And none of this would have happened had it been not been so easy to borrow money because the Fed was there to monetize it. So, you know, that, that's the heart of why I think it's the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, and every everything else that threatens what we believe in, uh, you know, is put in danger as a result of the bad money and the uh, fiscal excess that lies at the heart of the system. Uh, I'd like to repeat um, what I said before, that, uh, David, I think you're uh, edging very uh, close, if not committing the the diamond's water paradox fallacy. Yes, Fed is important. Who could deny that? Uh, The monetary theory, uh, financing is very important. But there are other things, too. For example, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, Donald has done pretty well on the Supreme Court compared to what what, uh, Biden will do. Uh, Judy Shelton, he tried to get Judy Shelton, who who is not really as um, good as as you and I and Tom on uh, the gold standard, but at least she favors the gold standard a little bit, whereas um, Biden isn't going to do anything like that. Uh, I could make a case that education is more important than the money because education determines... um, uh, ideas of people. Uh, you know, they say the pen is mightier than the sword, and you think, well, the pen is this big and the sword is that big, and, you know, any debate between them, the sword is going to beat the pen? No. The, the, uh, the pen will beat the sword because the pen determines in which direction the sword is pointed in the first place. Well, what's going on with education? Betsy DeVos, bless her, uh, had, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm in the university now, and, and before her, uh, you know, if uh, somebody complains about somebody, the burden of proof is on, on the, uh, 
the, the accused to prove that he's innocent. Uh, she turned it around. Uh, she did very well. Uh, Donald uh, is threatening to cut off money from Harvard because they are prejudiced against um, Asian people. Uh, Don, you know, education is pretty important. Now, look, I'm not committing the Diamond's Water fa uh, Paradox fallacy. I'm not saying education is it and, and nothing else uh, counts. But, you know, uh, I think I can make a decent case that education is maybe more important than the Fed. But again, it's a marginal thing. And, and I resist the, this notion of yours of focusing only on, on one small thing. At, and on that one small thing, there's nothing to pick between the two. So, uh, you know, you have to go to other things. And then other things, as Tom was uh, mentioning in his question to you, Biden is way better. Uh, again, I, I returned to my children when they were five and seven and they were having a debate and they would say, anything you can say, I can do better. Well, anything you can say about uh, Donald and you say it brilliantly and you say it voluminously and very well, and, and I'm a big fan of yours for saying that, I can say much more about uh, Biden. So uh, I, I, I can't understand why, why, um, why you have Trump derangement syndrome, in effect. Um, why not have Biden derangement syndrome? It's much easier to do. Uh, 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 Trump uh, picked his Supreme Court uh, judges based on the Federalist Society. Well, the Federalist Society is, um, I don't know, two-thirds conservatives and one-third libertarians, or maybe three-quarters and one-quarter, I don't know. But I've given many lectures to them, and they're a pretty good group. Uh, uh, Biden is going to pick um, a Supreme Court nomination on the base, and, and Kamala Harris is going to, uh, you know, anyone that the Federalist Society says, that they, they, they'll, uh, you know, eschew. So, Again, I return to my Wall Street Journal uh, article, and I say that um, the libertarians who uh, voted for, um, what do you call it, Joe Jorgensen instead of uh, Donald were mistaken. Uh, they shouldn't have done that. And, and uh, you know, you talked about hat and cattle. At least he, ha he has a, a hat there. How about Romney? You know, you're talking about the um, uh, 50, you know, uh, one of the senators is Romney. Romney is a rhino, Republican in name only, uh, and you're relying on Manchin. Well, you know, Manchin has got a pretty good uh, Democratic uh, voting record. Uh, Romney uh, is a, a loose cannon as far as that's concerned. So it's really crucial about the uh, the vote in Georgia. And, and, um, and Purdue would now be uh, the 51st senator, except for libertarians. Uh, what's his name? I forget the guy who ran. Very nice guy, a libertarian. He ran for senator, uh, and he got 2.1% of the vote. And in Georgia, in order to become a senator, you have to have 50%. Yeah. You have like 49%. Uh, he would have he would have uh, been in. Whereas if we lose two of those people, it's on the libertarians, uh, the ones that you're defending and I'm attacking. I think they were excruciatingly wrong in uh, not following uh, the uh, libertarians for Trump uh, analysis of uh, when you're in a purple state, all bets are off. You got to go for the better one. Look, you know, um, um, a lot of times people say you shouldn't vote at all. Voting is evil. And, and this is esoteric libertarianism. And what I say is, look, suppose you're a slave and the master has two um, overseers, overseer goody and overseer baddie. And overseer goody will beat the crap out of you once a month. And overseer baddie will beat the crap out of you equally well once a day. So who should the slaves vote for? Overseer goody. And I can just see you saying, well, Overseer Goody's a bad guy. Overseer Goody shouldn't beat the crap out of you once a month. Well, yeah, you're right. He shouldn't beat the crap out of you once a month. But better to have the crap beat out of you once a month than to have the crap beat out of you every day. And, and you're on the side of being, you know, what are you, a masochist? You want to have the crap beat out of you every day? No, it should be once a month is better. Donald Trump is better. So everything you say about Donald Trump, I agree, but but you have to compare it. Remember the 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 uh, the joke I told you. Well, I'm not a good joke teller, so it wasn't very funny. But uh, I'll repeat the joke. Economist was asked, um, "How's your wife?" He said, "Compare to what? Compare to what? You, you got to. You just can't keep going on and talking about how evil Trump is." Yes, I agree. He's evil. You got to compare okay. it with with Biden, and Biden is more evil. Well, okay. It reminds me of the other story about the economist I know who was at the bottom of a 30-foot hole. Uh, and his assistant asked him, well, how do you propose we get out of here? And he answered, well, assume we have a ladder. Now, uh, <laughs> my, my problem is uh, you're assuming we have a ladder that Trump would make any difference. To I have a subtle point, Walter, that I think is important to say. I was defending the libertarian voters in Georgia and elsewhere who voted at the presidential line 
and not the people uh, who vote who uh, voted for the Senate candidate in Georgia. If I lived in Georgia, I would have voted for the presidential candidate on the libertarian line, but I would have voted for the Republican candidate early and often because my whole analysis is one of political realism and political, uh, I guess you would say prog prognostication if you have to uh, put it that way uh, over the next period. And I believe that if we uh, maintain the Senate, and we will, even with the rhinos and even with Manchin on the other side, they will not vote to end the filibuster. Crucial, critical, almost end of story, first point. Second point, they will not vote to pack the Supreme Court. If that's the case, Unless somebody gets hit by a bus, there's not likely to be that many vacancies over the next four years. So I applaud what Trump did in appointing the vacancies of the last four years. I don't think it's that important, uh, crucial going forward. Thirdly, on the big bad stuff on the Democratic agenda, this isn't Trump versus Biden. This is just how much of this stuff is likely to get enacted in a Republican controlled uh, Senate, uh, you know, over the next two years, uh, because I think the off year election is going to bring, uh, you know, uh, the House down on the left progressive Democrats in the Biden administration in 2022. It's just a guess, but that's what I'm saying. In the interim, uh, I don't think with a divided Senate, there's any chance of Medicare for all. I, you know, you may rejoin the uh, Paris Accord. That's just a lot of rhetoric and international arm waving. They're not going to pass real legislation that, uh, you know, puts the frackers out of business or, you know, outlaws fossil fuel uh, uh, production and consumption anytime soon. So all the really bad stuff that everybody should be concerned about uh, I think is a low risk of happening. And therefore we get to the fundamental thing of how do we dig out of this 30 foot hole of massive financial bubbles, debt that's out of control, not just at the government level, but in the whole society. I mean, we got 80 trillion, $81 trillion worth of debt on the public and private economy now, the highest ratio to GDP, it's over 400%. In history, uh, you're, you're not going to grow when you're lugging around 80 trillion of debt enabled by a Federal Reserve that has pushed interest rates, you know, to the uh, to the uh, zero uh, bound, as they call it. But in real terms, have made them uh, negative. And as a result, you got a massive abuse of the capitalist system in the financial markets. The financial markets today are just big gambling casinos because the Fed is enabling gambling. They're not doing their job. They're basically liquidating equity capital when the financial markets are supposed to be a source to raise equity capital. They're essentially loading up the business system with unproductive debt when the financial markets are supposed to be a place where you uh, uh, raise money to fund uh, productive investment. So we could go on and on, but the point is we're not going to get out of this 30-foot hole. We're not going to get from here to there until we get a Republican Party that at least might begin to believe that sound money has to be reimposed. Now, you mentioned Judy Shelton. I don't think, I can't imagine how Trump ever agreed uh, to nominate her because at least at one time in life, she was reasonably sound and did understand, uh, you know, uh, what the gold standard was and why uh, it worked as well as it did. But uh, my point about Judy Shelton is that you have a Republican party today that's been so euthanized uh, by easy money uh, rhetoric of the guy in the Oval Office and by so many years of pretending that the Fed was rescuing us uh, from our own uh, folly, that they couldn't even get her through on a 51 uh, you know, vote uh, margin. Uh, and she's only, you know, sort of modestly a nod, uh, one person out of 19 in the direction of sound money. So that to me, that's the problem. To me, the Republican Party is the problem. It's rotten pretty much to the core. It has to be purged. We have to get, you know, 
make one more effort to get uh, a Taftian, as I said it for shorthand, view of the world back in the center of its platform and of uh, its uh, policy agenda. And as long as Trump is there with his crazy, demented view of easy money and interest rates need to be zero because we're the best economy in the world, so we should have the lowest rate. I mean, what kind of nonsense, what kind of complete baloney is that? All right, well, that, that, when you have the Oval Office saying that, when the bully pulpit is saying that, the, you know, the Republican voters who mean well out there in flyover America are being totally confused and miseducated about, uh, you know, what, what needs to be done, what policies uh, will make a difference, what policies in the long run will improve their life. Finally, on the matter of education, you know, I would say, it shouldn't matter who who is the president on education because education is not the job of the Oval Office. It's not the job of the federal government. Education is the job of uh, state and local, uh, uh, you know, units. That's why we have eighteen thousand school districts. And frankly, again, going to my root of all evil: easy money, uh, monetization of the debt, the root of all evil. We actually put out a hundred billion a year of student loans, which makes the college system, if you will, you know, uncompetitive because everybody's got free money from Uncle Sam. And as a result, they can peddle all this absolute leftist progressive baloney that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, at the uh, core and center of college life in the curriculums today because they don't have to make a market test. If families had to raise this money, if you had to do like I did when I was a kid, you probably did too, you know, work 25 hours a week while you're in school uh, in order to pay the tuition and work in a factory uh, two shifts in the summer in order to save up something, you wouldn't necessarily be wanting to turn over your hard-earned tuition money to, to schools that are doing the nonsense going on today. So again, the federal government wouldn't be pumping out, and this is the honest to goodness number and truth, $100 billion a year of walking around money uh, to you know, 15 or 18 million students, I forget the exact number, uh, if there was a real market test uh, for how you raise that money and how you finance that money. So it all goes back to the same starting point. It's not the Fed standing alone. It's the Fed as the center of a nexus that leads to a massive um, expansion and bloatation of the state, which then in turn nurtures and fosters and finances all of these uh, aberrations that we uh, you know, are so concerned about, including the whole mess today in higher education. All right, I'm gonna let Walter have, have the last word here because I think we have a sense of where you guys stand at this point. So I, I want to give Walter a chance to say one more thing and then we'll call it a day. Okay. Well, I, I agree with uh, the import of what Tom was saying, and that is we're not going to uh, improve the Fed uh, for the foreseeable. We're not going to get rid of the Fed or we're not going to have um, a monetary sense um, uh, for the long term. Therefore, we have to choose uh, uh, other things. And uh, you can't tell me that Biden is going to be better on this than, than Trump. Uh, they're, each one is worse than the other. Uh, uh, and, and if anything, um, uh, Trump is a little better. At least he tried with Judy Shelton, which you acknowledge uh, she's better than whoever um, Biden would pick. Now, I agree with you. Um, I'm glad that we agree that uh, libertarians should not have uh, voted uh, um, for uh, the libertarian candidate uh, for the Senate in Georgia. I'm glad that we agree on that. But I think that the same principle applies to the president as well. You want uh, um, um, Purdue instead of um, uh, his opponent, Asing, I think is his name, uh, because we want to have the Senate as a bulwark against the uh, crazy Democratic president if Biden um, uh, does uh, come in. But it's the same principle. Uh, I think you, you keep evading uh, the point that it, it's um, – uh, you know, you keep saying, well, Trump is no good. Trump is um, uh, libertine on money. And, you know, I agree. But but Biden isn't any better either. Uh, 
Now, you say uh, on education, you say, I can make a point that education is more important than the Fed because if, if everybody took Austrian economics, um, you know, we wouldn't have the Fed because we'd vote out the Fed or we'd vote out the politicians who would get rid of the Fed. Education is very important. Now, maybe I'm prejudiced in this since I'm, I'm in a university, but, you know, at my school, Loyola University, New Orleans, and let me put in a plug, uh, students come study with me, you'll get, um, you'll get a free enterprise perspective on this. And I'm sure David would agree with that. Um, during the, um, the period when the students first come in, they're given um, an introduction to school, and the introduction to school is mainly wokeism. And then uh, we, we, at Loyola, we now have a, um, a two-week seminar in, um, in uh, January, and, and all it is is um, uh, wokeism and uh, politically correct nonsense. Now you say, well, it shouldn't matter. But it does matter. It shouldn't matter that, namely, the, the, the federal government uh, shouldn't have any role in, in the university. But the federal government does have a role in the university. Look, suppose um, I were gonna, there were two people, and um, Goody was going to punch you and give you 500 bucks, and, and Batty was going uh, to punch you and give you no money. Who would you pick? The punches can't change. You're going to get punched. Well, this way you get 500 bucks. That way you get five cents or you get nothing. Well, you pick the 500. But you, you keep saying, that, but uh, being punched for 500 is very bad. Well, yeah, being punched for 500 is very bad, but you have to go ceteris paribus. You have to say other things are equal, and now who's better? Now, look, I agree with you entirely and enthusiastically that the crucial element in determining the future for our children and our grandchildren is can the Republican Party gain some uh, level of sanity? Not gain. It never had any uh, level of sanity. I mean, you go back um, uh, for, I don't know, 50 years, and, and there's nobody in the Republican Party except for Ron Paul and maybe Rand Paul who wants to end the Fed. But you're quite right. Uh, we, we should try to improve the Republican Party. Now, the question is, what's the best way of doing it? Is the best way of um, uh, improving the Republican Party having Biden? And by the way, there will be one more Supreme Court uh, nomination. I forget who it is, but he's 82 or 83, and in four years he'll be 87, and you know he might retire. So there will be at least one person, and, and we're going to get a very different kind of jurist from, uh, uh, from uh, Biden than from Trump. So um, to me, it, it, it's... Uh, difficult to see how uh, the Republican Party can be better uh, improved because uh, Biden is in there and Biden is going to do all sorts of very bad things. With, and, and the Paris Accord is not, uh, you know, just uh, frivolous. It, it, it's indicative of something. Uh, you know, uh, we're not going to have fracking. We're not going to have oil. We're going to, everyone's going to have to have a, uh, what do you call it, car, um, electronic car, uh, CAFE standards. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of crazinesses that you keep ignoring. And I, Again, to summarize very quickly, yes, Biden is very bad, and you were to be congratulated, David, for showing in, in fine detail just how bad he is. <laughs> but I have a homework assignment for you. Your next book should be How Bad Biden Is or How Bad um, Hillary Would Have Been, and, and you'll have a book twice as big. Okay. And uh, Tom, thanks for having this um, on, on your show. I, I greatly appreciate it. Well, I want to thank both you gentlemen. Uh, David, I know you have things you still want to say, but we'll we'll carry it out in our respective online outlets, so uh, carry on this conversation. And, and speaking of online outlets, uh, folks, check out David Stockman's ContraCorner.com. I'm linking to that at TomWoods.com slash 1785 and also WalterBlock.com. You'll see that over the years, Walter's written an article or two that you might want to take a look at. So those will both be at TomWoods.com slash 1785. Thanks to you, gentlemen. I uh, hope you have a th happy Thanksgiving and talk to you again soon. David, it was a pleasure. Tom, it was a pleasure. Okay, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Definitely, definitely do not miss tomorrow's episode because there you're going to hear the audio of the talk I gave to a room full of state legislators telling them about the whole COVID thing. A lot of them were very well informed, but also urging them to be the voice of the voiceless. So you're going to want to make sure not to miss that. Black Friday is upon us, which means two things. Uh, number one, libertyclassroom.com is on a big, big sale, the master membership, where you get absolutely every course we have, every course we will ever create, plus all the Ron Paul curriculum courses I created. It is a massive bundle of knowledge available to you at a massive discount. So check that out at libertyclassroom.com, Black Friday. And then the other thing is, you know how I'm always helping people get publicity for their websites, the only thing you need to do is just get your hosting through my Bluehost link, 
Well, Bluehost is having a big, big Black Friday sale, the best deal of the year. So even if you're not totally sure what you're going to do, you might as well lock that price in now while you can. So tomwoods.com slash publicity will tell you exactly how you get all my goodies. The direct link right to Bluehost, my direct link is tomwoods.com slash blue. But then how you get all the goodies and the publicity from me is at tomwoods.com slash publicity. All right, that's it for today, everybody. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.